Yeah, so today we're very happy to have Bruce give us their, their talk and object space for right angle dark angle. All right, thank you very much. So I know some of you were here last week and heard me give the first two talks on general art and groups. Um, today's talk is independent of those two. There will be art and groups, but only right angled art and groups in this in this talk. All right. So, um, OK, so let's get started. So this is uh, I'll be talking about joint work today with joint work with Corey Bregman and Karen Boatman. And Corey will be giving his talk tomorrow, which will be a follow up on some of the things I'm talking about today. All right. OK, so. Um, let's start with just um, a couple of basic definitions and notation. Um, different people have, we've heard about right angle art and groups from several people, but everybody has their own notation. So um, let's establish the notation we're going to use in this talk. So I'm going to start with a finite simplicial graph gamma. So finitely many vertices and, so, um, and some edges. And associated to that is a right angled art and group. So those of you who were here for my lectures last time, we, we started with graphs, but we labeled each edge with some, some, into, some natural number um, and that determined what the relation looked like. Well, we don't bother to label this time because all our edge labels are twos. So we don't bother to write it on there. And all our relations are just commutator relations, SISJ equals SJSI, okay? And the, and the edges just tell us when, uh, when there's a relation and when, and when there's not a relation. Okay, so those, these are called right angled art and groups. Um, and I'm not gonna explain why they're called right angled art and groups. But if you want to ask me later, I can tell you. <laughs> um, and um, associated to a right angled art and group is um, a, a very nice K pi one space known as the as the Salvetti complex. So what do we do? We simply um, start by for the Salvetti complex, we put it down a loop for each generator. And then, of course, if two generators commute, we want to attach a torus to those two loops. Um, that will give us the right fundamental group, but it's not, but it's not a K pi one space yet. So to make it a K pi one space, we also have to fill in a K torus, a K dimensional torus for each K clique, for each time we see um, K vertices, all of which are connected by edges. And why do we have to do that? Because once we've done that, it's easy to check that what we have is a locally cat zero cube complex and hence its universal cover is cat zero and hence contractible. All right, so that automatically means that we have a, a, a K pi one space. Okay, so very nice, simple to um, think about and describe K pi one space. So let's just look at um, a couple of examples. Um, so I'm gonna, so, so the theme of this talk, as you will see, is going to be that there are two extremes here, the case where no two vertices are connected by an edge, a discrete graph, and the case where every two vertices are connected by an edge. Those are the extremes. And then we have a lot of uh, other possibilities in between, but we'll always kind of look at what happens at the extremes and then kind of combine them to see what happens in between. So at the extremes, um, the Salvetti complex, if, if gamma is discrete, then the art group is just a free group, no relations at all. And the Salvetti complex is just the rows. It's just a bunch of loops. That's it. Nothing, nothing, nothing higher dimensional. All right. Um, at the other extreme, we have gamma as a complete graph. In that case, every two generators um, um, commute. And so we just have Z to the N. We just have a free abelian group. Um, and in that case, the um, well, we start building, we start building, but what we discover in the end is we have just one gigantic N torus is the Salvetti complex. That's it. That's the whole, that's the whole Salvetti complex. Okay. So let's just quickly um, draw one in between just to, just to, you know, get, get um, in shape here. All right, let's do this and let's, um, let's label them um, A, B, C, D. And, all right, is my, is, are my generators. And um, okay, so what's my Salvetti complex here? Um, um, well, um, I'm not going to write out what a gamma is. You can you can read it off this. Um, but my Salvetti complex looks like what? Well, I start with four loops. A, start with a loop A, B, C, and D. So we'll label these A, B, C, and D. And, and then for each edge, I need to glue on a torus, all right, a two torus. All right, so let's just um, glue on some tori. So we might have a torus that connects these two. 
Um, and then, um, of course, I'm not really drawing a torus, but the torus that connects these two and uh, a torus that connects these two. And that and that's it. That's my Salvetti complex. It's three tori, which are pair joined along a, a single curve. Okay, so it, it, easy to um, easy to construct. All right. So what do I want to study today? Is the outer automorphism group um, of a right angled Artin group. All right. So what is the outer automorphism group? Well, you take the full automorphism group and you mod out by what are called the inner automorphisms. That is automorphisms given by conjugating by a fixed element conjugate the whole group by a fixed element. Those are boring. So we mod out by those and, um, um, and talk about the outer automorphism group. All right, so um, what do we see at the two ends? Well, at, at one end, we have the automorphism group of a free group, a very much studied um, group. There is a zillion papers out there, all kinds of interesting facts about this automor outer automorphism group of the free group. Um, and at the other end, we have the outer automorphism group of, of, of a free abelian group. What is that? That's just GLNZ, all right? Another group we understand well. So we know quite a bit about the, uh, about the automorphisms uh, groups at the two ends. And the question is, um, you know, to what extent do, can these theories be extended over automorphism groups of, uh, outer automorphism groups of all right angled art groups? What can we say about those? Um, all right, so I've been working on this off and on for a lot of years. Um, and much of the work at the beginning was done out using algebraic methods, all right? So we were able to show that certain subgroups were preserved and we got projections from out of, uh, of our original group onto out of something smaller. And we showed that those projections satisfied the properties. Anyway, it was all, it was all algebraic, algebraic um, um, analysis. And we were able to prove a, a fair amount of stuff using, using these algebraic methods. Um, I have several papers with um, Karen Boatman on this, and also Day and Wade did um, some beautiful work on this, so, and various other people. So there's a lot of, a lot of work done algebraically, but um, we decided it was time to create a geometric object on which, being geometric group theorists, and we like, we like geometry, um, we wanted to create a geometric object on which, on which this acts. So the, the sort of the whole, um, um, this whole, I should say, the theory of, um, I, I, of a, a automorphism groups of free groups, a lot of it was motivated from the theory of mapping class groups acting on Teichmuller space, all right? And, and the idea was to create something that, that, that this outer automorphism group, something like a Teichmuller space and use it to study the groups, okay? So that, that was a, sort of the motivation behind um, um, some of these constructions. Okay, so that's our, that was our goal in this project was to develop some kind of geometric tools to study these groups, all right? What, what could we construct geometrically that would help? So what do we have at the two, at the two sides, right? We start at the two extremes and see what we have. So um, at the two extremes, um, uh, at the, well, on the right, let's start on the right hand on the, at the abelian side, because everybody knows kind of about that. Well, what does GLN act on, GLNZ act on? Well, the natural thing is the homogeneous space, GLNR, um, mod, mod um, the orthogonal group, ONR. That a, has a nice, contractible, you know, ver very nice understood space. And we have this nice action and um, it, it's, it can be used to tell you all kinds of things. Okay, at the other end um, is something called color in Boatman's outer space, um, which was, oh geez, when was that introduced? A long time ago now. Anybody remember? What eight? <laughs> 86? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so um, they, they defined a space on which um, the outer, um, uh, out of the free group, out FN, um, acts. And I will be telling you a little bit about that space if you're not familiar with it, not in a great deal of detail, but I'll be, I'll be explaining a little bit what that is. And that space has been used to study these groups extensively. I mean, all kinds of um, properties uh, more recently, um, there's been people have put metrics on these and studied the, and the dynamics of the actions and classified elements of the group and done all kinds of interesting things with by stud, by looking at the out FN and how it acts on on outer space. Okay, so um, so where are we? Um, well, the question is, we want to we have a lot of other groups in here, and um, in particular, out of a gamma, one of our right angled Artin groups. 
and we want it to act on, well, what? <laughs> what goes in between, right? Well, whatever it is, it should be a contractible space. I mean, these, these all these spaces are, you know, you want a contractible space with a nice action, like a proper action. Generally, these actions are not co-compact, but I'll get back to that. But a nice, some nice um, proper action on a contractible space. Okay, that's what we want to construct. That, that was our goal, is to extend from the left side to the right side. Um, okay, um, so how do we do it? Well, we're kind of going to merge the constructions from color and vote in space with the homogeneous space in some way that allows us to, to you know, make sense out of this for any right angled art groups. All right. Okay. So let's talk about a little more about um, how we view these two the things at, this, at these two ends. And then we'll be able to talk about what is involved in merging them into a single bigger space. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start with the abelian case. All right, any, quest any questions so far? OK, so let's start with the case where it's just um, my gamma is a clique. So my, my um, a right angle Orton group is just a free abelian group. All right, see you at the end. OK, um, um, and, the, and in that case, out of a gamma is just GL and Z, as we said before. And um, uh, the Salvetti complex is a single torus. So. Here's what I want to, I want to, I want to think about this action of GLNZ on the, on the, um, on the homogeneous space. How do I think about that action? Well, okay, the homogeneous space, all right, I could say it's matrix group modulus, some other matrix. I don't want to think of it that way. I want to think of a point in homogeneous space as being a flat metric on this N torus. This N torus, by the way, secret is, is the Salvetti complex, right? So I want to think of I'm putting a I'm putting a flat metric on this Salvetti complex. All right, what do we mean by a flat metric? Well, I mean, how well, how do we do this? Well, GLNR, if you just think of it, say it's column, it gives you a basis. You know, these are so I've got some arrows here, and N is two in my picture. I've got some basis, and those generate some torus. But the, the sum of those, that lattice, gives it gives rise to a torus and gives a metric on this torus. And the fact that I've knotted out by O and R simply means I don't care. Like I could rotate that if I wanted, so that the this um, 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 so that this vector, yeah. Um, uh, so I could rotate it so that this vector goes down, you know, get, goes down to here or whatever. I don't care. I don't care if it's position. I care about its shape. Yes. Okay. So that's the point. It, um, so it gives me a, um, um, a, flat, um, a flat metric, but a flat metric with a marking. That is, I've chosen um, uh, two curves, which are basis for my torus, right? I, 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 so it's a flat metric together with a choice of generators for the, for the fundamental group. Yeah. Okay, all right. So that's how I want to think of points in here, and um, um, what and then and and what is the action of GLNZ doing? Well, I can just think of it as so, so. Sorry. So what is the marking? Sorry. So I have a flat metric on my torus, and then I have um, this marking, this thing, um, it, which is a, a, a choice of identification of the of um, pi one of Tn with z to the n, a, a choice of a specific choice of identification. So one way I can think about the action of GLNZ on this is that I'm just changing the marking. I am composing this given um, um, this given marking with some other map from Zn to Zn. Yes. So I'm just uh, so GLN just acts by composition on the on the on the uh, marking. Okay. All right. Good. Um, Okay, so um, let's let's now um, um, think about this whole space instead of that. Th th this is a particular point in this space. A particular point is a is a choice of, of flat metric. So now let's take um, a point in my space and let's take a nice simple um, um, uh, point. Let's take the the orthogonal metric on the torus. All right, I'm going to start with the orthogonal metric um, and, my, and my choice of, and I've chosen my generators, A and B. And now supposing I act an element of GLNZ on it. For example, I could take um, this, uh, what's called a transvection, which takes B to B times A and leaves A alone. All right. So what do I get? 
Well, I get the same torus. I haven't changed the torus, but I've changed the marking. I've changed my choice of basis vectors. So I now have A and BA uh, are my new vectors. Notice that if I take the torus um, generated by those, um, it, it's the same torus because I could simply chop. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. I could simply um, chop here, cut here, and move that other triangle back across, you know, get back to the torus I had before. In other words, I haven't changed the metric. I've only changed the marking. Yes, same metric, different marking. All right, but I've got this nice contractible space I'm, I'm, I'm in. So that means there's gotta be some nice continuous way to travel from this point on the left to the point on the right. There's gotta be some continuous deformation I could do to get from one to the other instead of just jumping, right? Okay, how do we do it? Well, it's pretty obvious. We start with this orthogonal pair and we slowly start skewing one of them, yes? So what comes in between is, um, looks, like, looks like this. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this A and B. Oops, I should have done red. And I'm gonna skew it a little bit. I'm gonna skew B a little bit, and then maybe I'm gonna skew it a little more, and then I'm gonna skew it a little more. Yes, yes. So the so in the so the in the process, I'm I'm you know I first I have this torus, and then I have this torus. I'm gradually changing the shape of that torus, right? Okay, I'm just gradually moving it until I get to this thing on the right. So I gradually do this, I gradually do this, but now the metric on the torus is actually changed, all right? It's not the same. I mean, you, you can't just do this, let's cut it open and put it back here. For example, let's just take, um, let's just start here and, and start on a path, start walking orthogonally to A. I walk to here and I'm back to where I started, right? It's a loop, yeah? But if I start on one of these partially skewed things and I walk up to here, wait, I'm not back to where I started. Now I'm coming out here and now it's gonna go there. And oops, now I'm coming out here and I'm gonna go here. You could, you could see that it, that path could go on and on and on and on and on. It's not the same. It's just not the same. It's a truly different metric, all right? So what's happened is the point, my point being here is that um, um, we need, to change the metric on the torus to get from, from the, the left side to the right side. So even though the two metrics are the two ends are the same, a path connecting them involves changing the metric, okay? Yep, skewing things, all right? So we'll come back to this, all right? Um, now let's go to the other end. Let's try the free group, all right? Okay, so now we're gonna take the case where A gamma is a free group. And now the Salvetti is just what's called the rose. It's just a wedge of circles, okay? And, um, and this time we wanna talk about color in Voltman's outer space. So what is color in Voltman's outer space? Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna be too formal, but basically a point in color in Voltman's outer space is a graph theta. So, so um, um, here, it's a pair, it's a graph theta whose fundamental group is this free group, Fn, together with a choice of identification of pi one with Fn. That's called a marking, okay? It's a graph and a marking up to isometry. It, it's a metric graph, by the way. The, the um, edges have edge length. You know, I'm allowed to assign lengths to the edges. So it's a metric graph together with a, a marking up, up to isometry. Um, so, um, uh, and how does, how does uh, the outer automorphism of Fn work? Again, it works by changing the marking. It, given, give, given an automorphism of Fn, I just compose my marking with this new automorphism, I get a new marking. So it just changes markings, okay? Okay, so here we, let's do exactly what we did before. We start with our A and B, two generators, and we wanna look at what happens when we take B goes to BA, all right? Okay, it doesn't do anything. We have the same graph at both ends. All I've done is change the marking. How do I move continuously from the left side to the right side? All right. Well, we do this by something we call folding one graph onto another. All right. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take this um, take this B edge and sort of fold it around the A edge so that it now goes around the A and the B edge. So in in the middle here, 
what I have is something that looks like this. So my A edge stays where it is, nothing's happened, but my B edge now gets folded onto A a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more until I folded it all the way around. I wrapped it all the way around and now it looks like this. Now it looks like the right-hand side. All right, so, uh, so the process is to fold it a little more, a little more, a little more, and a little more until I've wrapped it all the way around the B edge. All right, okay. Um, so um, what's happened here? Well, now we've actually changed the graph. We've changed the combinatorics of the graph. All right, it's not just a question of metrics. So, so important here, um, need to change, to change um, um, the combinatorial structure of the graph. Not just, not just the lengths of edges. All right, so um, here we go. We want to merge these two ideas into one gigantic thing because we have, because a trans, a, for example, a transvection B goes to BA in our right angled art group. Well, if A and B commute, then it looks like the first case. And if A and B don't commute, then it looks like the second case. We have to be able to do either one. Yeah, we have to be ready to prepare to go either way. All right, so, um, um, so so what's the idea in both in both this case and in, in 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 the other case in both the previous cases we started with the salvetti complex and then modified it we started with either a torus or a wedge of spheres and then started modifying okay so we want to start with a space with fundamental group a gamma um there's an obvious um space um how about um the salvetti complex <laughs> That's the obvious. That's the obvious thing to start with. So we're going to start with the Salvetti complex and and start modifying it. Okay. Um, so then modify it is necessary to allow us to move from one marking to another. Okay. All right. Um, and in the process, we will have to the Salvetti complex is a cube com a locally cat zero cube complex. We will have to be able to modify both the cubical structure and the metric. All right, we have to allow ourselves both kinds of operations. All right, okay. Um, so let's, um, I, I wanna describe what, what this outer space consists of, what these, these spaces look like. But um, to do that, I need to say a few words. Uh, so the construction of the outer space, we did in sort of two steps um, because of these two kind of different kinds of operations. Um, and to explain this, I need to say, uh, I need to just say a little bit about what the generating set for, for outer automorphisms are. Um, okay, so there are some, uh, so how do we get an, atom, uh, an automorphism of, of A gamma? Well, one possibility is that the graph itself has some symmetries, all right? So that will certainly just to permuting the, 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 the generators. Um, those are called graph automorphisms. Another thing we can always do is V goes to V inverse on any generator. Okay, those are called inversions. Um, the, the first two, the automorphism, graph automorphism and inversions, they just generate a, a finite subgroup. They're, they're not, we kind of ignore them mostly, so, but they're there. Um, um, the next one is partial conjugations. Um, okay, we've modded out by inner automorphisms, but inner automorphisms is something which conjugates all the generators by the same element. Yeah, what if we want to conjugate some of the generators and not others, okay? Uh, that's called a partial conjugation. And that happens in the following situation. So I, I suppose I have an element, um, I, th this is this um, picture here. Supposing I have an element V and I want to conjugate some things by V and not others. Well, things that are um, in the graph are attached to V, they commute with V, so it doesn't matter if I commute conjugate them or not, it's not going to do anything, okay? But what I want in order for the partial conjugation to be to be an automor uh, to be um, a, a well-defined homomorphism, automorphism, um, I, I need that when I remove the uh, star of V, namely V and everything it's connected to, um, that I have disjoint components and I can then conjugate any one of those components without conjugating the others. And that turns out to, to be a partial conjugation. So there are partial conjugations coming from this picture and the rest, the ones we really are gonna mostly focus on today are the transvections, uh, are, are you know the, the, um, the A goes to AB things we were talking about, which I put into two categories, 
depending on whether A commutes with B or A doesn't commute with B. So folds are when A doesn't commute with B and twists are when A does commute with B. And this other condition here, it's just once again, you can't send A to AB unless everything that A commutes with B commutes with and blah, blah, blah. There's some conditions under when you can do that, but let's not, not worry about that, okay? So there are these two kinds of transactions, either the kind where they don't commute is a fold, the kind where they do commute is, is, a, is a twist, okay? All right. So, um, so what we did, it turns out that if you, uh, if you don't allow twists and just look at the subgroup generated by um, one through four, that we call that the untwisted automorphism group. And it turns out that group kind of behaves quite a bit like, the, uh, like um, out of, uh, or out of um, a free group, that most of what you can do with free group you can kind of do here, all right? So we started out by um, with that case of it sort of ignoring the twists, all right? Um, all right, so this was done. We did this back in 2017. I did, it was joint work with myself, um, Karen Boatman and a student of mine, Nate Stambaugh. Um, and we built an outer space for the untwisted automorphism, group, uh, not allowing twists at all, okay? So for that, um, it, it's kind of, um, a, a version of, of, of color Voltman space. Only now, instead of just having graphs, we have these cube complexes coming from, well, what? Well, uh, we could say folding cubes onto each other, but that turns out to be difficult. Let me, let, let me, do, a, let me do an example, and then I'll explain more generally. Let's, let, let's look at a, a, spe, a case. All right, what is it we would need to do, okay? So let's look at the example where we have have um, um, just a, 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 B, and a middle thing, C. So, so this is just um, a free group on A and B, with both of which commute with C. So the Salvetti is a product, yes, of a rose and a, a, and a circle, all right? So it's just two, it's two um, tori, but it's better if I think of this as a product of a graph. So what do you think we're gonna do when we go? So I wanna take the um, transvection that goes A goes to A, B, like we did before, all right? Um, or sorry, B goes to BA, sorry, B goes to BA. This is, this is the transvection um, like it was before, B goes to BA, just what we did before on the graph, all right? We leave C alone. Well, so what do we wanna do? We wanna do exactly what we did in, 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 in the color vote in space, product with a circle. But what does that look like? Well, what does that looks like is we've kind of, we've got two tori and we're kind of folding one torus onto the other now, as opposed to, just folding in a graph, all right? So we have to allow for that kind of operation. But it turns out that defining what you mean by folding cubes onto each other is a little complicated. And it, it, an easier way is to look the other way around. Namely, on, it, let's just think about the graph case before we do the torus. Instead of folding one onto the other, we could just look at what we get in the middle and say we that's something which we could collapse back down to this or this. We have three edges, and depending on which one we choose to collapse, we get either A, B, or A, B inverse, all right? So a, a better way, uh, um, I mean, we are sort of folding things onto each other, but an easier way to define it is that what we want is a cube complex which collapses back down onto the Salvetti. And there may be several ways of collapsing and that will give us the kind of, this kind of structure that we want, all right? So let's look at what we mean by, by let me talk about collapsing, all right? So I wanna think it's, it, it's, it's the opposite of folding, but it, it's, it's an easier way to think about it, all right? So here's what I want. So I, we call them gamma complexes. They are again, locally cat zero cube, um, cube complexes. Um, which have the property that if I, there's a collection of hyperplanes, which if I collapse them, I'll define that in a second, I get back the Salvetti. So what do I mean by collapsing hyperplane? Not, that, not just that I get back the Salvetti, but the collapsing is actually a homotopy equivalence onto the, onto the Salvetti complex. I can get a homotopy equivalence by collapsing certain hyperplanes. What do I mean by collapsing a hyperplane? All right, so everybody knows what a hyperplane in a cube complex is. I think in a conference like this, everybody knows what a hyperplane in a cube complex is. So, so um, we have you know, these mid, mid, mid planes of, uh, of the cubes and, and we continue them as far as we can and it gives us a hyperplane, all right? 
But what I want to think of is not just the hyperplane, but the hyperplane carrier, all right? What's the hyperplane carrier? It's the union of all the cubes that contain a piece of this hyperplane, all right? So what does that look like? That looks like the hyperplane cross an interval. I mean, in every cube, you, you see the hyper, a cube has a hyper, a, 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 a midplane a mid cross an interval, right? That's what it is. So, so now I'm seeing not just the hyperplane, but the hyperplane cross the interval. By a hyperplane collapse, I mean, take that interval and smash it down onto the hyperplane. Just take the uh, edges that go orthogonal to this and, and collapse them. So I've drawn you a picture here, going from here to here. Do you, so do you see this? So I'm taking all the cubes containing this blue hyperplane H and I'm smashing them down onto H. And what I'm left with is the picture at the bottom. So each one of those red edges turns into a single point, into a vertex, and the other cubes are unaffected. They, 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 they are as is, okay? So I claim that I've got um, in this picture, I could either, I've got this, um, I've got this blue, well, it's cube, it's identified, but it, it, it's a cube that's been, you know, glued into a, a tube. If I collapse this hyperplane in the middle, I get this picture over here. Whereas if I collapse this hyperplane, I get this picture on the right. All right. So these two different collapsings give us two different maps onto the cell Betty. All right. Okay, so that's what my gamma complex is. Okay, I want no separating hyperplanes. There's a couple of conditions to keep it, to keep it nice. But basically, um, uh, up to a couple of conditions, I, want, I, I just want to allow for um, um, cat zero cube complexes, which have these nice collapses down, back down onto the cell bedding. And, and it turns out that's an easier way to describe what they are than talking about folding, but it's the same idea. Okay, everybody sort of have a picture of what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. All right, that's, uh, we're now ready to define our um, outer space, or rather it's really like the spine of outer space for those of you who know, who know, know about what that means, but don't worry about it. So, um, um, all right, so K, I'm gonna call it K gamma, all right? And a point in K gamma is a pair where X is one of these gamma complexes I just defined. So a gamma complex is one of these things that I can collapse onto the Salvetti, all right? So it's a... Um, um, we sometimes call it a blow up of the Salvetti, but um, um, so X is a gamma complex. And um, now I want a marking. And a marking is a homotopy equivalence down onto the Salvetti complex, all right? But remember, I said I can only deal with the untwisted subgroups. So I have to be a little careful about what these markings are. So I'm going to restrict my markings. And here's the rule. Um, I have an obvious, um, the fact that X is a gamma complex means there's some collapse down onto the Salvetti, all right? Take one of those collapses, and then I'm allowed to compose it with any untwisted automorphism after that, all right? Turns out not to matter which collapse you take. If it's true for one, it's true for all. Two different collapses will always differ by something in the untwisted group. So, so pick a collapse and then compose with any, any um, um, untwisted automorphism. And that's what's allowed in this in this um, space, that this initial space in, in, in this space, all right? That's what we're allowing, all right? Okay, so um, we look at the, um, um, uh, we, we look at all, we look at all such things and where, where by the way, the, um, the um, we're allowed to, in the cube complex, the, we're allowed to uh, adjust the lengths of the edges. So collapsing is just a, adjusting the length of the edges down to zero. I mean, there's a continuous motion between, between things by, by allowing edges to um, appear, disappear, you know, okay. So, um, all right, so we get, a, we get a space. We get a, we get a, a topological space out of this. Um, and, um, our, uh, and what we proved um, that back in 2017 was that this space is contractible and has a nice proper action of the untwisted automorphism group. Yeah. No. Oh, I'm sorry. On the on the um, I'm sorry. On this part, it is. It, on the on the on the um, spine part, it is. It's later. It's the next part that that isn't. Yes, yes, yes. You're you're okay here. Um, um, uh, okay. So that was kind of step one. It was just doing untwisted. But as I said, the untwisted part was the part that kind of acts like 
the free group stuff. And the question was, what do we do with the twists? You know, and that's that's the challenge. Okay, so that's um, step two, um, um, which uh, we recently uh, uh, we just which was work with um, um, Corey Bregman and Karen Boatman, and that pay, and the, what I'm going to tell you about now just just appeared in you know recent. Um, okay, so this is um, our new, new, new work, um, um, or fairly new, not as new as what Corey is going to tell us about. But <laughs> that, that work is still in progress. This one's actually been published. <laughs> okay, so, um, um, so how do we, now we've got to incorporate the transactions, the twist. What do we do? Well, uh, we start with the same set of um, cat zero cube complexes we had before, but we need to allow the tori to change shape, right? In order to allow for these other twists, we need to be able to gradually get from this to this. Um, okay, but we want to make sure that our, that our complexes at every point, we'd really like them to still be cat zero for, for various reasons, all right? So we don't wanna go skewing one cube and not paying attention to how it's connected to others. Things, it'll really ruin the cat zero-ness, but it turns out if you take entire hyperplanes and just slide the entire hyperplane to the left or right, it doesn't mess up. So, so um, look, look, look at this. Okay, so I have I have these four cubes, and they they add up. They're all nice. That you know the 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 the, the angle adds up to two pi. Were I to change just one of them, I could really mess that up. But as long as I always skew an entire hyperplane and move them. Sim, all the all the um, all the edges um, which are orthogonal that hyperplane get skewed by exactly the same amount. What I have is still cat zero. It's just not cubical in the normal sense. Um, so um, so that's what that's what uh, we allow. We allow this, and I'll call it a cat zero. It's parallelotope com com um, um, complex. So it still has this simplicial structure made up of cubes, but now they've been skewed. So they're parallelotopes. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So that's what we do. Um, and we, in fact, define a space um, which where the, where we, so let's remember what our, in, in our original space back here, uh, here it is, um, our, our, um, our um, yeah, we just have a pair, right? An X, which is a gamma complex and a marking, yeah? Well, I'm gonna add additional information now. I'm gonna, our, our new things, the X is the same as it was before. It's one of these um, things that can be, that can be um, um, collapsed onto, onto a Salvetti. The, um, the, the, the um, but F, what is F? It's a parallelotope structure. It's information about how we've skewed. It's basically says for every, um, um, uh, dual to a hyperplane, we can we can uh, describe a skewing. Although um, we don't allow skewing of everything, we only allow skewings of things that can be that you can twist onto. We only allow the skewings of things we have to. It, it turns out there's something called twist dominant and twist minimal. Certain things you can twist onto, and certain things you can't. And so we only allow skewing where we where we need it. That's all. Can you just tell us again how you did it? I don't understand how the skewing happened at the hyperplane. All right. If you have a whole hyperplane and you look at its you look at its um, um, hyper carrier, all right. Um, all I'm going to do it, it, normally you would have some edges that were do, that were orthogonal to the to the hyperplane that that connected the bottom and the top. All right. I'm just going to um, um, I'm just going to twist those all in exactly the same direction. So the entire upper the upper um, thing moves with respect to the entire lower one. All right. And all moves in the same way, so it's just that no longer are the um, the edges that are in the carrier orthogonal; they're now in some other direction. Okay, okay. But each, but we only get to specify one direction for each hyperplane because it all has to move the same way. All right. Um, and as I said, we don't actually skew all hyperplanes; only the ones we need to to make this work. So. Um, okay, so um, so F is, I won't say how we describe it, but we describe this parallelotope structure. We're given a parallelotope structure, which, which comes from skewing, skewing hyperplanes, okay? All right, um, what's phi? <clears throat> well, um, phi so far is, we're still gonna, re we still require it to be untwisted. 
Hmm, that's a problem. Let me explain why we require it to be untwisted. What we've done is we've basically put the twisting up, up in X in the shape, not in the market, right? There's two ways to think about a twist. Are we twisting by changing the shape or are we twisting by changing the marking? And if you looked at that first example I gave, um, you could do either one. You could get from the B to the A B either by changing the marking or by or by or by skewing my torus. Well, that turns out to be a problem. So the problem is um, that we'd like to say, well, let's let B be anything. But there, there in this in this um, there are two ways to describe a twist. Should we describe it as a as a skewed thing or as a change in marking? And we'd like those to be the same. And they don't play nicely with respect to each other in this in this space we we built. All right. It turns out there is no well-defined action of the twists on this thing. It doesn't you either put it down here or you put it up here, and the two don't don't coordinate nicely, and it causes a problem. So um, what do we do? Well, um, what we do is we say, um, why is this? So let's go back to that torus. Um, the point about that torus that we skewed at the beginning, that example I did give at the beginning, is that yes, we have a new, uh, the, our torus looks different when we skewed it, but metrically it's actually the same torus when it wasn't in between. Does, does everybody remember that? Here, let's go back, go back to this picture. Okay, so at the two ends, they were actually metrically the same torus. It was just the the the, the marking that had changed. We had come back to the exact same torus we started. In between, they were metrically different, you know, these things. But once we got to a full twist, the torus was back to where it started metrically. It was only the marking that changed. So that's what we need. How do we do that? Well, if we think of this picture at the two ends as parallelotope structures, they're not equal. They're not the same parallelotope structure, but they're the same metric torus yeah so what's the trick the trick is forget the parallelotope structure and just remember the metric just look at what metric space you have so here okay so um solution forget the explicit parallelotope structure and just remember the metric on this space x so the metric may come from a skewed parallel top structure, but I don't want to worry about exactly where the lines are drawn. I just want to look at it as a metric space. All right. So um, let's look at an example. What do I mean? Okay, here's gamma. It's um, uh, um, my my um, my Salvetti for this thing is a one torus with a with a loop glued on, right? A torus in a circle, right? Okay, but now um, maybe I fold the 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 circle onto the torus a little bit. So here's a here's a here's an example of a um a, of a space I could make. I just put the I, I instead of gluing the the circle back here, I'm going to glue it on here and then come back like this. So so what have I got? What does this thing look like as a as a cubicle thing? So uh, it's got um these two points. Um, let me show you the two points. Um, like this gluing point and this gluing point. Those are um, two points, so they have to correspond to vertices. I can't brand, I can only branch it, you know, if I, if I put a cubicle structure on this, uh, those are going to correspond to vertices. So I have my, um, my torus is, is subdivided, um, and then I have C connected to two different vertices on here, all right? Okay, so maybe I start with this picture, all right? Just a nice square, you know, orthogonal A and B, no problem. And now I'm going to take this, and I have these two hyperplanes I've marked by the red dots here, the upper, this one and this one. And I'm gonna skew one, but one in one direction, and one the other. I'm gonna skew these guys this way and these guys these ways. So, um, so it, it, you know, after a little while, it looks like this. Oops, uh, you know, it, it, I, I'm gonna push it. I'm gonna push this over. By the way, this this point, this red point can't move. It's right in the middle of uh, of my thing. It, it it's not allowed to move. All right. So I have to change the shape of the of the of the of the squares there. They turn into parallel types. And if I push a little further till the till these actually hit the middle point, I don't even need the second decomposition anymore. I, I, I can 
get it down to one cube. I claim that all of these pictures, they would be different if we were remembering the F thing, the, the parallel tub structure. They are not different metrically. They are identical metric spaces, all right? Identical metric spaces. So forgetting the parallel tub structure forgets a lot. It allows you to skew, but it, but it doesn't keep track of exactly how you're doing that. It doesn't keep track. There are many ways to skew and get the same metric. All right. So in so, but it turns out this fixes our problem because now all we care about is the overall metric, and we no longer have this inconsistency about whether we're changing the marking or the metric. That it, it, everything everything behaves nicely, and we can in fact now um, um, allow for. Our problem was allowing for um, um, twists. We can now, we're now going to allow any marking whatsoever. They can add twists, folds, we don't care what. Yes? When you use the same metric spaces, uh, it's naively, it looks like the two attraction points of the blue edge is actually changed in distance. No, no, no. I'm, these are not moving. I'm just moving, I'm, I'm just moving this, I'm just moving this, but I'm never moving that. It's always, it's always this, this line always stays exactly the same. If you cut this and put it back, it, it's always in the middle of the, I'm not letting that move. I'm only, so, so what you want to think of is you have your torus and you have your, and you have your thing. And all I'm doing is drawing different um, boxes on that torus. I'm not changing the metric ever. I'm just changing where I draw my, my little squares. That's all my little parallel goes. All right. So you got the same exact object. You're just chopping it up in, in pieces differently. That's all. Okay. So that's metrically never changing. All right. Okay. So that brings us to the actual outer space that we define. So in this outer space is um, we have um, a point has is three pieces of information. The first one is one of these gamma complexes, you know, one of these cat zero things we defined before, but now all we remember on it is its metric, all right? We no longer know where we drew our parallel graphs. We forget that and just remember the metric. And now we allow any market, any market can come, you know, so, so we know no restrictions whatsoever on what this homotopy equivalence is, all right? Okay, and the theorem we proved was that this is, uh, I guess the space we want, or at least a reasonable space to work with. Namely, it is contractible um, and it has a nice action of, of out a gamma, all right? It, the action's not co-compact, okay? But it has finite point stabilizers and it's definitely not co-compact in this case, all right? Um, okay, um, let me say, oh, I'm gonna end early. I was gonna say just a few words about, um, about you mean the space, the outer space? Not at this point, but I mean, you could, I mean, all this, many questions. I mean, it's, it's kind of brand new. So there are many questions. I mean, you could certainly, um, um, yeah, I'm going to list some questions at the end, but that's an interesting, um, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> um, um, uh, okay, so let me say a few words, and then I'll get at the end, well, I'll list some questions. Um, um, that um, let me say a few words about how how the proof of this goes. All right, just the the structure of the proof. So how do we do this? Um, we now have three different spaces um, we've talked about. Um, the first was the outer space that we did back in 2017 for the untwisted, the untwisted outer space, and that remember our our theorem back then was that we showed that this thing was contractible. Okay, I mean, the part about the um, finite uh, point stabilizers, that's easy. It's how to show it's contractible that's, a, that's the problem. So, so we showed that was our previous paper, all right? Um, then we construct this T gamma. That's the one where we did remember the, the parallel tub structure, but weren't able to um, do all the markings we wanted. And then finally, the one where we, that I just described. Okay, so I claim that there are maps, all right? So T gamma, um, is is basically the same as k gamma, except that we skew the except that we allow our 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 um, cubes to skew, right? 
So there's an obvious, um, a, a, an easy way to map that back to our old, it's, it's actually a deformation retract, which is straighten your cubes. <laughs> I mean, there's kind of a canonical way to take a, uh, you know, a, a cube that's been skewed and just straighten it all, okay? So it turns out that one deformation, that, that, that K gamma sits inside T gamma and T gamma deformation retracts back onto K gamma. Okay, that's good. Deformation retracts, so this one's, that's a homotopy equivalent, so this one's contractible, all right? So that, that part's not hard. Um, okay, what about this, all right? Well, in this one, what is, what is this map onto our new outer space? Well, we're just forgetting the parallel top structure and remembering the metric on X, right? We're forgetting it. But there's all kinds of problems here. It's not obvious that it's surjective because we've, uh, we're allowing more markings than we used to allow, right? We only allow some markings on uh, um, uh, certain markings up here, but then we allowed all the markings down here. Well, guess what? That skewing serves the purpose of giving us the extra markings that we didn't have before. I mean, that once we forget the, you know, a skewing is the same as a change in marking as we saw, all right? So the first thing you have to do is prove this is surjective. And then, um, and then what, we, what we do is we show that um, it's surjective and has contractible fibers. And that's the hard part. That's what most of the paper is about understanding what the what the uh, what this map does and what it can you know what what it contracts okay um, and um, that's tricky but we do in fact show that this state is a homotopy equivalence and therefore we get that this is contractible okay so that's where the hard work comes in is, is understanding what you lose when you as I as I showed you you lose a lot you have a lot of information in there that disappears when you when you just take account of the metric and we have to parameterize that and and see that that's that that's in fact a contractible set of space okay so um all right that's um sort of all i was going to tell you about that but uh let's talk a little bit about some some questions i mean what what now we have this space um and what do we do with it well you know, go 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 look up all the um um you know papers on on outer space use, using out f you know out on out fn and what they do with outer space. There are a zillion things you could list here. So I'll just mention a couple of things. Um, um, you know, maybe there's some kind of spine or way of um some something we could retract onto so that the action would be um, co-compact. It's not right now because of this, these fiber, these huge fibers. So is there some natural retraction that where the action would be co-compact? Um, or maybe just some kind of fortification? Could we just kind of put a boundary of some kind on this thing um, to, to um, use that we could then use to study, say, the dynamics of, of, of you know, you take a particular element of, of outer space, can you classify them? I mean, which ones? go to infinity and which ones, you know, got some kind of classifications of the elements um, um, and more generally just the dynamics of the action. Um, um, more recently, there's been a lot of work on um, um, using, uh, there's this Lipschitz metric on, on, on outer space for the free group, which is an, a, not a non-symmetric metric, but nevertheless, um, you can do a, a lot of interesting things with it. So um, is there a natural ellipsis metric we could put on this and, and study similar questions for, for these more general groups? So, um, so, and the last one is the one we are working on <laughs> and Corey's gonna tell you about um, tomorrow's talk, which is um, Nielsen realization. So the Nielsen realization theorem, um, well, um, I guess, originally for surfaces was that if you have a finite subgroup of the mapping class group, then it actually fixes a point in Teichmuller space. And in other words, there's a, there's a hyperbolic metric you can put on your surface, which is preserved by this finite, by the action of this finite group. All right, well, there, the analog for that is known for, um, for um, the free group, for, for free group acting on, 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 uh, on color vote in space, that given any a finite subgroup of out um, FN, it fixes some point in color vote in space. In other words, it fixes one of these graphs. So we'd like some analog of this. Given a finite group, can we find a fixed point, a nice, this nice cat zero, you know, skewed cat zero 
complex that that it where it fixes the the um, metric and the marking. Okay, so that's what we're um, kind of working on right now. And um, I'm five minutes early, but I think I'm going to stop there. So. <laughs> Well, that's the that's that's the question. I mean, that's what you know. That's why I say you know, look at what out. That's exactly right. You, what what can we use it for? Well, and for example, dynamic. You know, classifying things up to dynamical properties and 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 questions like that. I mean, what is it? You know, what do we know about mapping class group from looking at the action on? Are there questions about the group? Yeah, but some of those, I mean, what you're asking is, 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 a, is a valid question because we were able to answer a lot of the algebraic, you know, cohomological dimension stuff and, you know, with algebraic, you know, some of the obvious questions we already answered. Yeah, but using those algebraic methods I mentioned before that we, we don't need the geometry for. So, um, um, but yeah. I, Sorry. Right. Yeah, that's a good example, but is it type? Yes. Yeah. No, we knew that it's. Yeah, virtually torsion free. So like you could, so you. Finite, yeah. Um, um, I think that was already from, you already knew that from some of the algebraic, um, the day and Wade stuff, I think that was known. Some of these, some of these cohomological dimension things you could reduce already. I think that was known. Uh, yeah, you had your hand up, Percy. Yeah, uh, so for outer space, Two perspective graphs and the particular trees, and then there's also a nice three manifold when sphere of sequence. Oh yeah. Uh, is there is there some other model and, of, of this space? That no, that's a good question. I'm not not that I know of, but it's a yeah, it's a sphere, the sphere complex um, version. And not that I know of, but it's a certainly a valid uh, a, a valid question whether you could come up with some analog of that. Um, yeah. I was just wondering more about the other clip that you brought up, which is uh, 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 whether you, you think about like how it's changing the action on certain, like how an automorphism is changing the action. You start with a standard action on a standard complex. And I mean, I, I feel like in the beginning when you, when we were, when you were talking about outer space, even like you know, before you started working on it, yeah. for this, like how, like, how could I think of it that way? Instead of like an automorphism changing and act like thinking about it in terms of group actions on trees, group actions on group complexes. It's like changing the action of the standard action of the art group on its self, on the universal cover of its self any complex. Um, if you thought about that, I just feel like that that's a I that's a perspective that's yeah, so you're just going to take a, a point and look at its orbit. Is that what you're saying? So you're not going to change the thing you're acting on, and you're just going to look at the different ways it can act? Is that a oh, way? I'm not sure. Like, you kept drawing pictures in the quotient, and I want to think of those pictures somehow in the universal cover. I want to just think about, like, I don't know. I'm thinking of starting with the standard action of the group on the universal cover of the subheading complex. Right. Of this group, and I have an action on this two complex. Right. But if you want a different action, that would be just like moving this point around by an automorph. If you translate that by an automorphism, then you get a new action yes. on the same object. So that's why I'm saying it's the orbit. What you're asking about, sort of. So, what is it you'd like to know about that? I mean, it does move them around. But... Um, I mean, we do sometimes think about the action on the universal cover instead of on uh, instead of just as a marking. I mean, certainly a marking is 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 equivalent to giving a different action on the universal cover. I mean, we certainly well, use that. About, yeah, but I what just I just trying to think. Three group where you think about instead of thinking of outer space in the way that you describe it, color development, I'm thinking about it as the space of certain kinds of actions on trees. Oh, and I see. Like, I want to. I want to look at that analog. Right. For okay. So right. That's right. Okay. Yes. So the first question is, what's an analog of a tree? Yes. Because it's not just the you know the the one. Okay. All right. So right. So you have 
uh, you have actions on a whole class of, 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 um, of cat zero cube complexes, a certain class of cat zero cube complexes. Yeah, I mean, you could certainly um, think about it that way. I mean, I, 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 I should say that there, you could do more complicated Q complexes. We have kind of limited what we're allowing, but deliberately, because we are trying to keep the dimension of this space from getting too big. I mean, you, you just, if you allow all Q complexes that have the right fundamental group, you, just the thing just blows up and gets too big. So, you know, we were pretty restrictive in what it was we were allowing really to keep this space manageable and and you know not too big a dimension questions of you know cohomological keeping at the cohomological dimension um you know as some kind of balance so yeah okay if we have no more questions for you that seems yes let's thank you again Okay, let's meet again at 12 10 for Alex. All right, thank you.